This is American Government Monday, November 9th, 2020. Um, today, uh, most of our discussion will consist of an examination of the important Supreme Court case, Marbury v. Madison in 1803. And um, what we're going to hear, what we, what we saw in our last lecture was um, uh, how the framers in the Constitutional Convention sort of passed uh, very quickly on the issue of the judiciary and on this important question of whether the judicial branch possesses the constitutional power to examine the constitutionality of the acts of the other two branches and the states for that matter. Well, let, let me just say again, as I pointed out, it's not controversial with the states. Article six explicitly uh, requires the courts, both the state courts and the federal courts, that when there is a conflict between a state law or even an element of a state constitution and, uh, and the federal constitution or a national law or a national treaty, judges have to declare the state law or constitutional provision null and void. So uh, again, um, the point of examining in detail this important court case Marbury v. Madison, where Chief Justice John Marshall uh, essentially embodied the core. Now, his, his opinion isn't an exact replica of, but it's clear that, John, that J Chief Justice Marshall embodies the core of Hamilton's reasoning in Federal 78 that we examined last time. And then we'll conclude with an examination of the other great voice from the time of the founding, um, another Virginian, Thomas Jefferson, who believed that judicial review was never part of the constitutional system and that for such a power to be exercised, like the presidential veto would have to be explicit, actually in the constitution and not just implied as it is in Marshall's argument. As you'll see, um, Hamilton, when he, we, as we saw when he set up the argument for judicial, judicial review in Federal 78, he says some people think that, that the judges being able to declare the acts of the other two branches, the laws of Congress, the acts of the president unconstitutional might imply a superiority in the judiciary to the other branches. That's exactly what uh, Jefferson uh, argued. And as we'll see, um, um, that's the losing position because uh, it's kind of parallel to the Hamiltonian view of the presidency. Uh, as opposed to the Madisonian view of the presidency, as I pointed out many times in our previous discussions, uh, that um, Hamilton's view has won out in the last 240 years. And in the same way, Justice Marshall, Hamilton's and Justice Marshall's view of judicial review has won out. There's nobody in our, um, uh, in our uh, constitutional system uh, or public life lawyers, politicians, academics, um, even the, and the judiciary, of course, itself, that disputes or disagrees with uh, uh, Chief Justice Marshall's reasoning in Marbury v. Madison. And in some ways, the Jeffersonian position has been the losing position. But as you'll see, even though nobody contests uh, that the courts have and should have this power, that's not where the contemporary controversy and <coughs> debate hovers. It's what's the nature of that power and what is the scope of that power. And as we'll see when we conclude with the judiciary, that's where the debate is. All right, so uh, let's talk about Marbury v. Madison. And there's a nice discussion of this uh, in, uh, uh, that's helpful in background, but I'll go over a little bit of that in uh, chapter 12 of Wilson. So who were the parties? William Marbury, and um, and we'll see that there are interesting elements of the background of this case, which which wouldn't have passed in today's um, uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence. Um, all of these parties were intimately involved with each other, including the Chief Justice, as you'll see. All right, so let's get the big background. In 1800, the Federalist Party, which was Hamilton's party, and John Adams's party and even Washington's party lost. And the Republican Party or the Democratic Republican Party won uh, almost all levels of office and in fact destroyed the Federalist Party 
for all intents and purposes until the resurrection of the two-party system in the late 1820s and early 30s under Van Buren and Andrew Jackson, as we have seen previously. So one other important thing to remember that don't forget that until the 20th Amendment, the beginning times uh, uh, of office holders, the Congress and the president were on March because that's on, because the first Congress in 1789 convened late. It was supposed to convene earlier. Uh, the elections were in November, as they always have and, and have been. Um, uh, but uh, it wasn't until March uh, that the new Congress, uh, March 4th, 1789, the new Congress, the first Congress convened. And then, of course, George Washington was elected president. Um, but so at this time and up until 1936, I think, is when the 20th Amendment or a little bit earlier when the 20th Amendment was passed, um, uh, there was this long lame duck period. And the Federalists, the outgoing party, uh, seized the initiative, uh, not unlike President Trump and the Republicans this fall, uh, this last fall, um, uh, they seized the initiative and created a whole set of, of judicial appointments, um, new judiciary appointments and uh, positions. Congress creates them, still does, by the way, and, and, um, and filled those appointments. And John Marshall uh, was... John Adams's Secretary of State, and um, and in the last minutes of the Adam, Adam administration, four of these commissions um, for new judgeships had been appointed. They'd been ratified by the Senate, and the president, President Adams, had uh, put the seal of the United States had sealed them. Uh, you'll see those are relevant to the legal questions that John, that that Chief Justice Marshall asks. So um, anyway, uh, the, in the haste of cleaning up and getting out of the office of Secretary of State, Secretary of State John Marshall neglected four of those uh, commissioned appointments, including William Marbury's, who was, I think, a District of, District of Columbia judge. And when uh, uh, the, President Jefferson came in and the Jefferson administration got uh, uh, um, going, President Jefferson appointed James Madison as his Secretary of State. And uh, when Madison came into his office in uh, March of 1801, he discovered these undelivered commissions, signed, uh, sealed commissions. Let me just re repeat this again. President Adams had appointed these, had nominated these justices. The Senate, the Federalist Senate, had ratified them. The appointment then went back to President Adams, who, consistent with Article 2, uh, Section 3, commissioned them. That is to say, drew up the, the appointment to office, put the seal of the United States on them, and literally the only failure was the failure of Secretary of State John Marshall to deliver those commissions. They were just sitting on the desk. Madison discovered those, brought them to Jefferson, and said, Jefferson's, and Jefferson said, file them in the circular file cabinet, which is the wastebasket. Don't deliver them. Now, we're not going to go fully into this aspect of the case, but there was a reasonable dimension for that. The president nominates members of the judiciary and the Senate, uh, up, uh, nominates them. So, and Jefferson thought, well, I can unappoint them since they haven't gotten their commissions. They're not completed yet. So that's, as you'll see, part of the legal questions of the case. So anyway, uh, so that's who the parties are. Uh, whenever I teach this, and since I'm old and senile, uh, I say it has the same thing when I teach Congress. I, I forget that I'm at Converse teaching Congress and blah, 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 to teach Justice Marshall uh, in Marbury v. Madison, all these M's, it's very difficult for an old, feeble mind to get through without misspeaking myself. But at any rate, so William Marbury was one of those justices. And so when he didn't get his commission, he knew it was coming, he sued. And so in 1803, this finally came up to the Supreme Court two years later, and that's how the case was generated. Now, um, um, again, you could say, don't forget, again, these are dimensions of the case that are important, but we're not going to um, go into them. Remember, uh, the members of the executive branch, are the, their boss is the president. 
and uh, if, if the president gives them a legal order, they have to obey it. And that's exactly how Jefferson and Madison understood. Jefferson was the president. He unappointed, in his mind, uh, uh, Justice Mar uh, William Marbury. And so uh, part of the question of this case was, could the president do that? And we'll talk about that in a minute. So that sets up the case. So Marshall starts out, uh, uh, um, and by the way, in today's court culture, because Chief Justice Marshall was the same person, who, Secretary of State Marshall, who failed to perform his function, uh, <clears throat> he probably would have recused himself, which is a fancy word for refuse to sit in the case, because he was so intimately involved in it. With that being said, um, John Marshall, who went on to serve for 34 years, by the way, he was one of the, up until um, uh, um, Douglas and Brennan, uh, whom Brennan, whom we'll read um, uh, later on in this week, um, um, uh, Marshall was the longest serving Chief Justice, 34 years. Uh, and then uh, Douglas and Brennan in this century, or the last century, out, outstripped them. But at any rate, <clears throat> we'll see why this is such an important case for the Supreme Court and for an entire constitutional system. So Marshall starts out, and this is the key to understanding the case, Marshall starts out with three questions. Now, typically, the legal question in the case is, what three questions of law and legal interpretation does the court have to get to in order to reach its judgment? So what is the judgment in this case? Either Marbury is going to get his commission or is not. That's what the court has to decide. Um, so the legal questions are, and, and, and Marshall's quite explicit about this, but as you'll see to interpret the case, you have to see that there's a fourth question, the big question, the question that Marshall doesn't state at the beginning of the case and only comes back until later. So what does Marshall ask? What are the three questions we have to ask to decide this case? Does Marbury have a legal right to the commission? Yes. Why? Here's the answer. Uh, it's true. The president has broad discretion in appointing. I'm, now, what I'm doing is I'm answering that first legal question as Marshall does um, and, um, and, uh, and, and speaking in his voice. It's almost, if you saw the great movie Ghost, where Whoopi Goldberg gets taken over by these ghosts, and I go, oh, 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 oh possessed. I'm now being possessed by John Marshall's spirit. I know, isn't this exciting? Um, so um, anyway, uh, Marshall says, it's true. The president appoints uh, and, and can boss his subordinates around. <clears throat> so no question, Secretary of State James Madison was acting under um, uh, uh, President Jefferson's direction. So the question is, did President Jefferson have the authority to order State uh, Secretary of State Madison not to deliver those commissions. Here's what Marshall says. No. The president's acts fall into two broad categories. Those with, where the Constitution gives him broad discretion, like, for instance, the president has the power to appoint ambassadors. Um, if somebody was to, supposed to get an ambassadorship to Lower Slobovia or another third world country like South Carolina, um, you couldn't, that, and, and the president changed his mind. Or, or fired him. That person couldn't sue the president in court because, um, uh, because those people serve at the president's pleasure. That's part of his constitutional discretion. But then Marshall says the president has other magisterial duties. He can't order his subordinates to break the law. And therefore, here's uh, Marshall's point. Once this nomination was ratified by the Senate, once um, Jeff, uh, President Adams put the seal of state on it. Uh, that became, and, com and he legally commissioned Marbury, that is to say, said this appointment process is final, then, then that was done. That commission at that point became Marbury's legal property. He had a vested right in that commission. And therefore, in the same way that if a, uh, a postal delivery person decides that he wants to keep your mail, and decides not to deliver your mail, that's against the law. And you have to order that person to perform his legal dis that, And so in, in some ways, Marshall argues that Secretary of State Madison was just like postal delivery, and he failed to deliver what was the legal property of, Mar of Marbury. So that's the answer to the first question. He did had a vested right. Now, it's a common principle in English common law and our British common law, uh, British common law, and we've taken it over into our judicial system, 
that for every, every legal wrong or injury, there is a legal remedy. So since the legal harm done to Marbury was because a legally appointed agent failed to per, per, perform his duty, the legal remedy, the second question, is there a legal remedy, uh, is yes. Now, um, in the British common law system that goes back to the 1100s, that's when the British system began to develop and, and, and developed what's called the common law, um, oh, one of the things that judges do is issue writs. A writ is a formal judicial order. There are writs of warrant, like when a cop goes to a cop, excuse me, a police person, uh, goes to a judge to uh, check into somebody's house, they have to get a writ of warrant. We call it just a warrant, but it's a writ of warrant. There's a writ of habeas corpus. There's a writ of injunction where a judge says to an official, don't do that. Here the writ is a writ of mandamus. Mandare is the Latin word for to command. Mandamus is the Latin word for we command. So a writ of mandamus, because people who speak English can't pronounce Latin properly, a writ of mandamus. Um, is a judicial writ ordering a public official to perform his legally his legal legally defined duty. So there is a legal injury, there's a legal remedy, a writ of mandamus. And then the third question is, is it a writ of mandamus issuing from this court? <clears throat> it has to say, Marbury came to the Supreme Court for his remedy. Why? Because, well, the Supreme Court's a, one of the three branches of government. It's of equal dignity to the presidency. Why wouldn't you go to the Supreme Court to order the chief of the executive branch to do his legal duty? And here Marshall answers the question, no. Uh, it can't, I can't do it. I'd like to help, but I, can't, I don't have the legal power to do it. But why did Marbury come to the Supreme Court? Because it turns out that if you remember the first Congress that met on, as I've already said, March 4th, 1789, it had to do several big tasks. It had to set up the executive branch, and so it created the five departments of the executive branch. It had to set up the judiciary, uh, create the offices, because Article 3 says the judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time establish. And that's what it did in 1789. In these fundamental acts, it set up the executive branch, the judicial branch, and don't forget, that first Congress also uh, passed and sent out the, the first 12 amendments to the Constitution which were ratified as the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, which of course is the Bill of Rights. So Marbury came to the Supreme Court to get his commission, to get a writ of mandamus, because it turns out when the Congress set up the judicial system in 1789, the Judiciary Act of 1789, in section 13 of that law, it gave the court the power to issue writs of mandamus. Now, the answer to that third question is, why can't I do it? Because the law granting me the power to issue me as Supreme Court justice, that is. The law granting me the power to do this is unconstitutional. And therefore, uh, since the law gives me a power that I am not entitled to because it conflicts with the Constitution, I can't help Mr. Marbury. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay in front of you um, the section of the law that was declared unconstitutional. I'll talk about it a little bit. So get ready for some long and boring legal language. Um, and then I'm going to discuss the part of the Constitution that, Matt, that Marshall said, I almost said Madison, that Marshall <coughs> says violates the Constitution. Uh, there was a 20th century justice uh, who said, all the court does when it declares a law unconstitutional is it sets the Constitution down it sets the law next to it, and if the law doesn't jibe with or match the Constitution, out goes the law. That's a kind of a simple-minded way of viewing it, but okay, that's what, that's what it is. So what's the law, and what's the part of the Constitution that Marshall says that law violates? Now, the, law, the text is in the notes, but I'll read the entire text of Section 13. I'm going to need my extra eyes for this. Get prepared. Um. <clears throat> Section 13 of the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789, and be it further enacted that the Supreme Court shall have exclusive jurisdiction of all controversies in a civil nature, where a part, state is a party, except between a state and its citizens, 
and except also between a state and citizens of other states, or aliens, in which latter case it shall have original but not exclusive jurisdiction, and shall have exclusively all such jurisdiction of suits or proceedings against ambassadors, other public ministers, or their domestics, domestic servants, as a court of law can have or exercise consistently with the law of nations. And original but not exclusive jurisdiction of all suits brought by ambassadors or other public ministers of other governments, that, by the way, that's what that means, or in which a consul, which is a kind of a subordinate ambassador, or vice consul shall be a party. And the trial of issues also shall, in fact, uh, and the trial of issues in fact, in the Supreme Court, in all actions at law against citizens of the United States shall be by jury. That is to say, when the Supreme Court sits as a trial court, which it very rarely does, um, then uh, it shall be by jury. Now, uh, I've italicized the part of the law that Marshall declares unconstitutional, and so let's continue. The Supreme Court shall also have appellate jurisdiction from the circuit courts and the courts of the several states. Again, when you read ch chapter 12 of the Wilson text, you'll, it will describe the structure of the federal judiciary, and you'll understand those terms better. In, all, in the cases herein after specifically provided for, specially provided for, and, listen, shall have power to issue writs of prohibition in the district courts, to the district courts, in the cases herein after specially provided for, and shall have power to issue writs uh, of mandamus in cases warranted by the principles and usages of law to any courts appointed or persons holding office under the authority of the United States. So that's the law that grants the Supreme Court to issue writs of mandamus, which is to say a judicial order commanding that official to do his official duty to public officials of the United States, which um, uh, Secretary of State Madison in this case clearly falls into. Here is the part of the Constitution. Uh, let me just explain what this law is doing. In Article One, uh, Article Three, uh, uh, Section Two, it lists the jurisdiction. Now, jurisdiction is a legal concept. That means the right of that court to issue a judgment in that particular issue. And there are different wi ways of defining jurisdiction. The most common way of defining jurisdiction of a court is geography. Uh, the district court in in um, uh, on the East Coast that includes South North and, uh, Carolina and part of Virginia, if you have if you, you're suing somebody in Missouri, you can't go to the court in North Carolina um, unless that citizen is in North Carolina. But but literally, everyone understands uh, you have to go to the court of local jurisdiction. But there's also jurisdiction by the degree of appeals and everything, and also by parties. And the Constitution lists several um, parties that the court has original jurisdiction in. That is to say, original jurisdiction versus appellate jurisdiction. This is the critical term in this case. Original jurisdiction means that case can originate in that court. Appellate jurisdiction means it has to start in a lower court and has to, if it's gonna become part of a higher court, it has to work itself up to appeals. So when it, with respect to where a court, where a case begins, there are two kinds of jurisdiction, appellate and uh, original. And so what this part of the law is, is doing is setting up that, it's, it's taking that constitutional distinction and trying to give it legal force or embody it in the judiciary structure and processes. Now, um, uh, um, uh, what, so here's the part of the Constitution that Marshall says this law violates. Clause, Article 3, uh, Section 2, Clause 2. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and remember, public minister and consul means officials of other countries. These are all three members of, of one class. Ambassadors are representatives of other governments, public ministers are representative of other governments, foreign governments, and consuls are. Like, there used to be a French and a German consulate uh, in Spartanburg, but I, I think there's still a, a French consulate. I could be wrong about this in Spartanburg. Uh, it might have been moved to Atlanta or consolidated in Atlanta. The reason that there'd be a French or German consulate in Spartanburg is because there's so much French and German businesses like Michelin and BMW um, uh, in uh, Spartanburg. But at any rate, here's the part. So let's continue. 
this is Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2 of the Constitution. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. Now, of course, the members of the first Congress, when they passed this law, that's exactly what they thought they were doing. They were taking that part of the Constitution and setting it up. Marshall says they did it wrong. How? How does this law, this part of Section 13 of, that, of the Federal Judiciary Act, how does that conflict with the Constitution? Here's what Marshall says. Article 3, Section 2, Clause 2 lists the cases and parties under which the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. Again, where a case can actually originate in the Supreme Court. All other cases, uh, because don't forget, in an enumeration is a list. When you list something and don't include something on a list, the clear implication is it's not included. And as you'll see, that's the key to Marshall interpreting as part of the Constitution. So all other cases have to begin in a lower court and be appealed up to the Supreme Court. What Marshall argues is by giving the Supreme Court the power to issue a writ of mandamus to a public official of the United States, it in effect added a class of parties. It expanded the court's original jurisdiction uh, when in fact the, the list it provided in Article 3 was meant to be exhaustive. So again, in giving the Supreme Court the power to issue a, a command, a writ of mandamus, to a public official of the United States, like the Secretary of State, Marshall argues it violated the Constitution because it added a class of parties to the court's original jurisdiction when that is strictly defined constitutionally. Um, now, here's just a question to think about. Well, then why didn't Marbury go? Why didn't Marshall just say, well, you can't come to this court first. You have to come up to it. Um, and, and why didn't you start in a lower court? And therefore, uh, the writ of mandamus is given as part of appellate jurisdiction. That's a difficult question. We won't go into it in this class, but in my constitutional law class, I discuss this exhaustively. But at any rate, that is Marshall's argument. Now, those are the three explicit legal questions in the court, in the case. The fourth question, the unspoken question, uh, which is implied in the third question, but this is the really big question, is uh, can the Supreme Court declare a law of Congress unconstitutional. Um, now, Marshall, in his, in his um, understated rhetoric, says, this is an important question, but thank goodness, not a complicated one. Uh, so this is the real the important legal question of the case. Can the Supreme Court declare a law of Congress unconstitutional? Um, now, I've broken this down in the notes into two parts, theory and text. One of the great things about Marshall's opinions on the Constitution, and you've already read Marbury v. Uh, McCulloch v. Maryland from 1819, one of his other great opinions, Marshall typically uh, uh, brings three kinds of evidence to as a legal standard in deciding constitutional cases. Um, theory, like what's the theory? Like remember um, uh, in McCulloch v. Maryland, the theory was uh, a, a supreme national government limited in its core, and the theory was the nature of the enumerated powers, which he reads broadly, if you remember. But Marshall always creates a, 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 an argument or a proof out of the text of the Constitution. Now, um, uh, as you'll see, so we'll, uh, he also often looks at his, history of, of a particular clause of the Constitution, but in this important case, he's discussing two kinds of proof a theoretical proof that he has to answer, and a textual proof. So in turn, the, uh, the, uh, the theoretical argument breaks down into two sub-theoretical arguments. The th first question, the first theoretical question is, can a law of Congress be unconstitutional? Um, and then the second theory is, can the Supreme Court be the body to make this judgment? As you're going to see, Jefferson doesn't disagree that a law of Congress might conflict with the Constitution, although you'll see he fudges that question first, but then comes back to a definite answer. 
Yes. So interestingly enough, on this first theoretical argument, can a law of Congress be unconstitutional? Jefferson does potentially agree with it. But what he disagrees with is the second theoretical argument, that the Supreme Court is the body that, that, can, that can make that judgment. So as you'll see, the second part of Marshall's theoretical argument is, is, is that, yes, the Supreme Court can and is the proper body to decide if a law of Congress is unconstitutional. By the way, the president can decide that, too, because the president can veto a law for any reason he wants. So if the president thinks a law that Congress has passed is unconstitutional or just bad policy, he can, he can veto it for that. So what Marshall is arguing is, in a way, the court has something like a veto power over Congress's legislation, but only on the question of whether it matches the Constitution or not. Now, what? so let's look at the, the two sub-parts of his theoretical argument. Can a law of Congress be unconstitutional? Yes. Otherwise, it'd be like the British Constitution, which isn't written. And every time that Parliament passes a law, strictly speaking, it modifies the British Constitution. Um, and major constitutional changes in the British Constitution are often just passed by parliamentary law. Marshall says that's not part of our theory. Part of the theory of a written Constitution is the people, the fundamental source of the authority, we the people of the United States, grant to the Constitution the power uh, to govern. And then in the vesting clauses, uh, think of this as a trickle-down image. The people are supreme or fundamental. I know uh, supreme means highest, fundamental means fun foundational. So uh, if we bounce back and forth between the people's authority being supreme and foundational or fundamental, uh, uh, in this case, they mean the same thing. All legitimate government power comes from the consent of the people. That's the Declaration of Independence. So um, Marshall says the people are supreme. They grant the power to govern to the Constitution. And then the Constitution creates three siphons, uh, uh, three, three uh, 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 pipes of authority, the vesting clauses. The power to govern then, uh, to pass laws, is granted to Congress. The power to execute through them and, and do the executive power is granted to the president. And the judiciary power, judicial power, is granted to the judiciary. So. Um, so what Marshall is saying is, you have to presume that the acts of a subordinate might conflict with the acts of a superior. If you don't, then Congress has the power to shape the Constitution however it wants without any limits. Marshall says, unless a, a law of Congress can potentially violate the Constitution, then the Constitution doesn't limit the, the power of Congress. And bam, you're back to an unlimited government. So this first theory is, it's inherent in the nature of a written Constitution. The written constitution is the supreme act of the people, and it's meant to be fundamental, enduring, and permanent, and to limit the branches of government. If you don't, if you, if it, if a law of Congress is held to be, if if any law that Congress passes is assumed to be constitutional, then you've destroyed the limits on Congress's power, and that's inconsistent with a written constitution, which means a limited government. That's his first argument. The second theoretical argument is, answers the question, can the Supreme Court, or any court, can the Supreme Court make this decision? And, and here, Marshall essentially embodies that long middle part of Federalist 78 that Hamilton wrote. So, um, uh, so in a sense, Marshall is borrowing Hamilton's reasoning, and here is his reasoning. Yes, the court can declare a law. Why? Because the core function of the courts is to decide cases, but the courts have to have legal standards. They can't just say, well, uh, you win this case because you're wearing a nice blue dress or because I like your hat. That yarmulke you're wearing makes you look very dashing. No, courts have to give reasons for their decisions, and, and he's right about this. And uh, moreover, courts have to interpret their standards. And here's where his argument sounds very much like Hamilton's. The typical legal standards for judges resolving course case cases, whether they're criminal cases, holding you know sentencing somebody for violation of the criminal law, or civil cases where somebody decides which who wins the suit in a party, uh, which party wins a suit, um, the the courts have to apply the laws and in doing so interpret them. That's part of the judiciary has to say what the law is, what the law means in specific cases. And here's where, again, he sounds like Hamilton. If two laws apply 
to the same case and the judge can't decide the case without interpreting both laws and applying them. But if one of the laws comes from a higher authority, then the judge, as Hamilton argues, and as Marshall says here, it is intrinsic in the judicial power for the judge to say um, the law of the inferior authority, Congress in this case, conflicts with the law of the superior authority, the Constitution, and therefore the courts do have the power to declare a law of Congress unconstitutional. Um, um, if that is to say, if if courts if, if the judges are to apply the Constitution as a legal standard, if if a law of Congress comes in conflict with the Constitution, the judges have to decide. They have to decide the case, and therefore they have to say they have to prefer the law of the superior, the standard. Now, in a way, what Marshall is saying is is that's just judicial control of their own branch. The judges control their standards of their own decisions, and that's why they have to have this power. And that is how he completes the theoretical argument. But he doesn't leave it there. In all of Marshall's great opinions, he always goes to the text to build his case. And there are three constitutional texts out of which he builds the case for judicial review. Now, as you'll see, they embody this larger theoretical argument that he makes. And what are the three texts? Article 3, Section 2. Um, well, and you can even back up Article 3, Section 1. The judicial power shall uh, be vested in one Supreme Court. So this court has judicial power. Article 3, 3, Article 3 Section 2 says, um, the judicial power shall extend to all cases and controversies arising under this Constitution, the laws of the U.S., etc. So what, the, what it says in Article 3, Section 2 is, when it says, the judicial power shall extend to all cases arising under this Constitution, Marshall correctly, I think, interprets that clause as saying that the judges of the Supreme Court and the other federal courts may use the Constitution as a law, as a supreme law, a legal standard. Therefore, interpreting the Constitution's meaning is part of the judiciary's authority by the explicit, lang explicit language of the Constitution. Second, Article 6, uh, the Supremacy Clause, which you're already quite familiar with. This Constitution and all laws of the United States in pursuance thereof and all treaties of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Marshall says that's a listing. And what comes first? It's a, it's a hierarchy, a pyramidal a pyramid of authority. What's listed first? The Constitution is the supreme law. Then the laws of Congress come when they are in pursuance of the meaning of the Constitution and the treaties of the United States. And then, also from Article 6, his third text, Marshall brings the oath of office. The members of the court, all, all federal officials, take an oath to support the Constitution. Therefore, if I'm a judge and I'm in a case and I'm supposed to decide the case and the Constitution is relevant to the case, the Constitution makes me take an oath to prefer the Constitution. I have to obey the Constitution by my oath. And those are the three parts of the text that Marshall creates his legal argument. So what is judicial review here? Again, to summarize, it's the power of the court over its own legal standards, a way of maintaining its own constitutional independence. Judicial review would appear to be the power to ignore as a legal standard a law of Congress uh, for the resolution of cases when that law is held to be by the judges unconstitutional. And that is Marshall's case for judicial review. And again, Marbury v. Madison is cited as a precedent. It still exists as a precedent for almost all great cases where the power of the courts are uh, involved. Uh, in the uh, confirmation hearings of uh, now Justice Amy Coney Barrett, um, the meaning of Marbury v. Madison was discussed. So um, how can you possibly argue with such a brilliant argument? Well, Jefferson wasn't exactly a third rater when it came to argument. And this is his anti-judicial review position, now Roman numeral two in the notes. Jefferson's argument is no, the Supreme Court does not have the constitutional authority to judge the constitutionality of the Congress or the president either. His first argument, as you're gonna see, Jefferson in this selection makes two arguments, his main argument and then a backup argument. His main argument is that each branch under the Constitution should decide the constitutionality of its own acts. Um, so that's his core position. 
The three branches of government, the three vesting clauses, create three branches of government, each with equal authority. Therefore, Jefferson accepts Hamilton's suggestion in Federal 78 that those people who think that judicial review implies judicial superiority over the other branches, Jefferson says, that's exactly right. If I can tell you what you can and can't do, I have authority over you. And therefore, Jefferson argues uh, for one branch to decide the constitutionality of the other branches, unless it's explicit, like the president's veto power. But don't forget, um, the Congress can override a presidential veto. The president may think and has the constitutional authority and the veto power to say that law is unconstitutional, but the Constitution finally allows Congress, as I just said, to override a presidential veto. So Jefferson says that means that even though the president vetoes, the president's veto acts as a check, then, um, uh, but nevertheless, the Congress can still reclaim its legislative authority and override a veto. If you were applying it to this issue of judicial review, Jefferson might argue that when the court applies its own standards, including interpreting the Constitution, it can decide this, but uh, Congress has the final authority to agree or disagree with the courts. That's how, how I would think if we had an alternative uh, constitutional system where judicial review doesn't exist, probably what would have happened was if Marshall claimed this power, then the Congress could claim then the power to repass the law uh, disagreeing with the court. That's, I think, how Jefferson would think this system would would work out. Um, but he has a backup position. Okay, so if one of the three branches has to have final constitutional authority, then it's not the judiciary who's appointed and is unelected and serves for life for obvious reasons. He didn't disagree with that. It's the Congress. Why? Because the Congress is elected by the people. Don't forget the Senate was elected by the state legislatures at that point, and the president was elected and still is elected by the Electoral College. Um, but the House was directly elected by the people. So in a way, what, what Jefferson is saying is, if one of the branches has to have final constitutional authority over the other branches, then let it be the Congress. Um, uh, because the Congress, this is a republic. The will of the people predominates. And, and ultimately, if the people think that a law of Congress is unconstitutional, the people vote the Congress in and out. Ultimately, what's constitutional and unconstitutional, according to Jefferson, is what the people think is constitutional and unconstitutional. Now, this isn't a stupid position. Um, and even certain judges on the court after uh, this great case of Marbury v. Madison held that position. It may not, not all, when you disagree with somebody politically, it doesn't mean they're stupid or they're your enemy. I hope that we've finally learned that lesson. Um, but, uh, but it means, but that doesn't mean that all arguments are equally valid either. You may disagree with somebody. And you could say that Jefferson's argument here isn't ridiculous, although that's not the argument that our political system adopted. It adopted Marbury, adopted Marshall's argument. And so, because Jefferson agrees that his first position, that each branch would decide its constitutionality, would lead to messiness and perhaps there has to be a final authority. But again, his backup position is it shouldn't be the, it shouldn't be the president, it should be the Congress. It shouldn't be the president, it shouldn't be the Supreme Court, it should be the Congress. Because ultimately, the source of constitutional interpretive authority is the people. And if the Congress does pass an unconstitutional law, the solution is not the courts to declare it unconstitutional. The solution is for the people to declare it unconstitutional in the next election. That's how Jefferson understands the question of constitutionality. Now, again, this is, this is a tough, complex question. And as I've already said several times, we've settled with uh, Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall and Marbury v. Madison, and that is our law in this system. Um, but as you'll see, those nagging questions that there's something undemocratic, unrepublican about this power of the unelected and permanent courts to say no to the people. Although, don't forget, that is part of what Hamilton says the purpose of a court in a uh, constitutional system is, if you go back and look at Federal 78. Um, but, but again, as a system, we have allowed the courts from Marbury v. Madison to assume this power. Uh, as we'll see, 
The big debate today is not whether the court has this power, but what the nature and scope of that power is. And that's when we'll turn to um, uh, Robert Bork and William Brennan. Uh, Robert Bork was appointed to the Supreme Court, but the, um, the Senate under President Reagan did not confirm his appointment. And he is the great source of the, uh, of the theory of originalism, which Justice Scalia and the, the judges that President Trump appointed, Gorsuch, uh, Kavanaugh, and now Barrett, are also advocates of. The advocate of the alternative approach to judicial review, the living constitution or judicial activist approach, is the great theorist was Will, William Brennan, Justice Brennan on the court. And so that's how we'll conclude our section on the court, looking at this great controversy not about whether the Supreme Court can interpret the Constitution, but how uh, uh, how extensive that power is vis-a-vis -vis the other branches in the states.